go live button, which means we've got to wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plains of the internet before we go ahead and get started. And it looks like we're just about there. YouTube is rocking and rolling, so let's do it, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Gruler. I am a criminal defense attorney here at the R&R Law Group in the always beautiful and sunny Scottsdale, Arizona. And today we're talking about Glenn Maxwell trial day 11. We've been on a hiatus for the last three days. Of course, today is Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We had no trial. We just finished with the government's case in chief. They went for about eight days, give or take, presenting all their evidence that they had against Galen Maxwell. Then we had a little hiatus because the judge, Allison and Nathan, had to go and appear in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee to get confirmed for the Second Circuit. And so she got interviewed yesterday. We talked a lot about that on the show. Today, though, was the beginning of the defense case in chief. The Maxwell defense team called their first witness, and we're going to talk about all the witnesses that they called today. We're going to, of course, start off with this woman. Her name is Miss Espinoza, and she was one of Epstein's assistants. You can see the courtroom here. She's going to be somebody that we talk about in the first segment. Before we jump into the next witness of the day, which was a very interesting witness, this is Dr. Elizabeth Loftus, and so she's going to be coming up second. We've got a little bit of preliminary stuff that we need to get out of the way, but you can see here, look at all the books this woman has written. She has a lot to say about memory, and so we heard a lot from her today, and so we're going to spend a lot of time listening to the direct exam and the cross-examination, and then we're going to finish with what happens next. The defense team, you can see here, Laura Menninger and Jeff Paliuka, they may be done this week with the entire case, with Maxwell's entire defense. They told us that they were going to be calling 35 witnesses but are they going to finish today? We're going to find out. We've got a lot to get to on the show. We're back in trial, and we're excited about it. If you want to be a part of the show, the place to do that is over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com, which is our home base, our little community over there, where there's a form that looks just like this. And if you want to participate in the show, you can use that form, and we'll get to your questions here at the end of the show. Super Chats also come in, and they show up on the screen just like that. Bing! And that's pretty cool. We appreciate it when you support us that way and we'll make sure we get those questions as well. And if you're looking for clips of the show so you can send little individual segments to your friends or family, we'd very much appreciate that. We have a clips channel, Robert Gruller ESQ clips. Galen Maxwell trial day 11 brings us the defense case in chief, meaning that the defense is presenting their evidence now. Prosecution has finished. They took a measly about eight days, 10 full trial days, two weeks, 14 days in two weeks, 10 trial days for weekdays, one day for opening arguments, one sick day. They started at 9 or 9.30. They finished at 5. You consolidate all that down, about eight days is what the government presented. And they were telling us it was going to be something like four weeks. So a lot of people were scratching their heads about that one. But now they're done. Okay, some people have uh, say there's a lot to be desired there. But they're done. The defense team is now on the field. So we've talked about a lot of these people already, but a quick refresher. This is the Galen Maxwell defense team. We've got Bobby Sternheim. She's sort of been the, the, the I would say the, the main attorney on the case who's been kind of consolidating and organizing the rest of the team. We've got Jeff Paliuka, Christian Everdell, Laura Menninger, and then somebody we haven't really seen in the courtroom is this guy. This is Renato Stabile, and he's somebody who does focus groups. And so, you know, if if you're talking about themes in a case and you're sort of testing different messaging, that's what that guy does. So a lot of the work was done before, obviously, the trial started, and that's what he was a part of. So before we get into any testimony, Judge Allison Nathan had some business to attend to. We've been out of court for three days, and so when you come back in, you got to warm up a little bit. As usual, we're following Inner City Press, one of the sources for great reporting on the Galen Maxwell case. He says... Judge Nathan came out. They've got some questions about Dr. Loftus. Now, Dr. Loftus is the memory expert we're going to get to. The U.S. government, we were talked about this yesterday on the show, or maybe it was the day before that, but the U.S. prosecutors, they wanted to limit her testimony. They wanted to stop her from saying certain things, and the court came out today and said, I deny the government's motion to preclude that type of testimony. I've ruled that these types of leading questions and these types of therapist techniques, she says, they're generally admissible, and so Dr. Loftus can come out and talk about it, and she did. 
Maxwell's lawyer also brought up another issue. They were talking about, sounds like it might be a, a positive COVID test or something like that. Talking about that they're going to anonymize the actual person that might actually have been testing positive for COVID. And so there may be a little bit of a COVID outbreak. Who knows? Bobby Sternheim, though, is talking to the judge about this. Judge Nathan says, well, if there is a COVID outbreak, there was a prior case where I let a juror deliberate remotely. <gasps> See that there? So a juror deliberating remotely. Doesn't that introduce a very curious little rub into this whole case? If anybody thinks that there's been nefarious activities thus far, can you imagine how much the volume goes up if you say, now we've got individual jurors who are deliberating in their homes and Epstein didn't kill himself? What's going to happen to those jurors who are deliberating in their homes? Yikes, not sure I'd want to be one of those people having to decide Galen Maxwell's fate when you have international Mossad agents after you. Okay, so here we can carry on. The judge came out and issued a ruling on that one. Loftus testimony can come right in. And we're going to get to that later on in the show. The judge also had a prior ruling today. Remember that in this case, we've been talking a lot about pseudonyms and sort of, uh, you know, fake names and, and you know, real first names, but not using the last name and making sure that we're protecting everybody's identity and privacy. This is a very high profile case. A lot of people are concerned about the testimony. A lot of people want to make sure that they're not in the bullseye of somebody who wants to get after them. And so when the prosecution got permission to do that, the defense raised their hand and said, well, if they're using pseudonyms, well, we want to use pseudonyms. Well, why can't we judge when they're using it and they're using these fake names and they're hiding everybody behind their veil of secrecy? We want to do that too. And so the defense submitted a motion about that. Judge, it's just not fair. So the judge came back out and said, well, I don't really care about your fairness. Judge Nathan issued in a ruling says the defense here on December 12th, just about a week ago, they moved to permit three expected witnesses to testify under a pseudonym or their first names only. This is what Maxwell's team wanted. The government prosecutors, they filed a letter. They opposed this request back on the 14th. The defense, Maxwell's team is saying that they want anonymity for the same reasons that the court permitted the government witnesses to testify under pseudonyms. Judge Allison Nathan says the court disagrees with this basic premise and denies the defense motion. No pseudonyms for you. Judge continues, says, these reasons for granting the government's prior motion do not apply to the defense's present request. Government request is different than the defense. Nathan says, well, based on what the defense has shown us, none of the defense witnesses intend to testify about sensitive, personal, or other type of conduct. Rather, they're all anticipated to deny the misconduct by Epstein and Maxwell, and therefore, they're not actually victims. So there's no similar concern for victims of abuse, for these victims here, if they, so here, here, what the judge is saying is there's a, a reason we do it this way. If you're a victim and you are forced to identify yourselves, then what that might create is a disincentive for victims to come forward because they have to publicly identify themselves and then face whatever repercussions come from that publicity. Here though, when somebody is saying, I wasn't abused, is there still a risk to them saying that? Or is it different? In other words, don't sexual assault victims deserve special protections? Well, the judge is saying, yeah, it kind of makes sense. These other people who are gonna take the stand, they're gonna say that there was nothing that wrong that happened to them. So why do they need any protection or anonymity? Judge says they don't. So we're going to see how that unfolds. Now, the first witness of the day, and remember, this is Maxwell's defense team. They're calling these people out, is Kimberly Espinoza. And it's Kimberly with a C, not a K. And it's Kimberly, to the best of my knowledge, not Simberly, like it looks. Here's what it looked like in the courtroom today. Kimberly Espinoza, former Epstein executive assistant. He had many of them. You can see that Judge Allison Nathan is in the courtroom adjusting the mask. Those things are so annoying. Court clerk or bailiff or whoever that is has her palm over her forehead buried in the computer screen. And to the left, you see Christian Everdell. That's one of Maxwell's defense lawyers. And so this is their case. They called her. They say, Simberly, you were Epstein's former executive assistant. You've probably got some juicy details for us, don't you? Here's another sketch. This one's a little more flattering, I think. 
versus that one. But you can take your pick. Testimony starts off again. We're checking in with Inner City Press today and Klasfeld reports over from Twitter if you want to follow them. Testimony starts. Christian Everdell, Maxwell's defense attorney, he is up at the podium. Kimberly Espinoza takes the stand. Everdell says. Kimberly. In October 1996, where were you living? She says, I started out on the Upper East Side, New York. Maxwell's lawyer says, I was hired as a lawyer for Jeffrey Epstein's company. Maxwell's lawyer says, would you recognize Miss Maxwell today? Espinoza says, of course, yeah, she's right over there. Looks like she's wearing a purple or a maroon sweater. I don't know. Judge says, uh, or, prosec- or defense says, let the record reflect. Judge says, so noted. Maxwell's lawyer says, where else did you work there? She says, well, I sometimes went to Galen's residence as well. I was there for Epstein. I also went to Galen's. Miss Espinosa, did you have any other personal assistants come through like Sarah Kellen or did you see Emmy Taylor gets into that line of questioning? Yeah, we did. We saw them come through. When did you see Sarah Kellen, says Everdell. Espinosa said, more towards the end. There were a lot of different assistants that came through, but I saw Sarah Kellen towards the end of my tenure there. So then they transition. They get into the Manhattan office, the office there. Can you describe that, Miss Espinosa? She does. She says, well, I go up there. You go in the front lobby and you go up the elevator and you turn around and you come out of the elevator. You get off there. There are restrooms. Jeffrey's office was in the corner over there, and I sat to the left of his assistant. My office was Galen's office, and we shared it. So you and Galen shared an office? Yeah. Maxwell's lawyer says, okay, well, when you worked there, did you sign a non-disclosure agreement? Obviously, a high-profile position. Did you sign a, you know, NDA? She says, yes, I did. Uh, tell me about what Galen Maxwell did when she was there. Espinoza says, well, she ran the properties for Epstein. And okay, so she was running properties. Can you describe for me, where did she sort of fall in the hierarchy of importance? You know, it's like Epstein, is it like Maxwell number two or three? Tell, t- describe that for us. Espinoza says, well, I mean, she was obviously very important to me. I put her up to the top. And to Jeffrey, I mean, given his personal residences, yeah, she was important. Talks about some other properties. Espinoza says, yeah, and, and, you know, speaking of these properties, Jeffrey acquired a Paris apartment. Then he got an island. It's called Little St. James. It got renamed over to Little St. Jeff's. Oh, and did you help there at Little St. Jeff's, says Everdell? She says, yeah, I mean, there was construction. There was a lot going on there. I did a, I did a bunch of stuff. I furnished the house, sort of made it a resort style, required a lot of work. She says, I mean, you know, there was so much work going on. We even had to ship in sand. And Everdell says, You shipped in sand to a tropical island? Espinoza says, yeah. He wanted more sand on the beach. And he wanted palm trees too. We even had a fire truck and firemen on the island. In the middle of an ocean, believe it or not. Espinoza says, before Jeffrey would visit one of the residences, we would fly in the bread he liked. I think we did the butter too. It's good to be a billionaire. Maxwell's lawyer says, and what about Emmy Taylor? Somebody else was there. What did Emmy Taylor do there? Kimberly says, so she would take care of the dog and she would carry Galen's handbag and she did all that type of stuff. So we have Emmy Taylor now. We have Kimberly Espinoza. We have butter and bread being shipped into Little St. Jeff's along with sand on an island in the Virgin Islands. Adam Classfield tells us a little bit more. Says, uh, Kimberly, did you know if Jane, remember Jane, she was the very first victim who testified. Do you know if Jane ever traveled on Epstein's planes? Kimberly says, I don't know. Prosecution objects. Because Everdell asked Kimberly about the relationship between Maxwell and Epstein. What do you think of their relationship? Overruled. Kimberly says, I thought it was a loving relationship. She goes on, continues talking about Jane. She says, I saw Jane on a soap opera. And I was actually a fan of that show. Not talking about the show, not identifying Jane. She says that Jane sent her 
signed headshots from the cast of that soap opera. Christian Everdell says, Ms. Espinosa, I'm going to have you an exhibit here that's been marked as Defense Exhibit 37.5. What are these here? Kimberly says, oh, well, these are headshots of three of the cast members, and uh, this one is a group cast member shot. He says, from that soap opera, correct? That's correct. The one that Jane wrote a note to you on, right? Yes, those are them. Okay. Espinosa then confirms the authenticity of those exhibits. How do you recognize these documents? How do you recognize these photographs? She says, well, no, they're, they're mine. Boom, authenticated. And can you, Kimberly, can you just read what the inscription here on this photograph, exhibit, whatever, says? She says, yeah, she'll certainly be happy to. It says, <clears throat> it says, uh, dearest Kimberly, thank you for always being so sweet and such a great help. Take care, signed Jane. Oh, okay. So Jane was having conversations with Kimberly. Thanks for being so sweet and such a great help. So we now have conversations. We have some timelines and we have a signed photograph and we have a soap opera. And somebody who's on a soap opera probably looks a certain way and those photographs get admitted. We also are narrowing in on some timeline, getting some more details. Testimony continues. Everdell says, uh, Kimberly, did Galen ever live with Jeffrey Epstein? Did they live together? She says, no. What about when they were in London over there at 44 Kinnerton Street? Do they live there? Or, have you been there? She says, yeah, I've been there about three years ago. Any idea who owned that residence? No, no idea. And so you were his assistant for a long period of time. Can you tell me, did Epstein ever receive female visitors in his office? She says, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to show you this document here. And this person is called Jane, right? Yeah. Do you recall seeing her in the office? Espinoza says, yeah, I do. And when you saw her in Epstein's office, how old did she seem to you? Espinoza says, 18. Everdell continues, and do you know if Jane traveled in Mr. Epstein's planes? She says, I don't know. She moved to California to be in a soap opera. It's my favorite soap opera. I have headshots she sent me, and that's where we get back into the other testimony that we've already gotten. They introduce these, copies for the jurors, read the envelope, and you heard what that said. All of that stuff gets admitted. So if you're a person observing this from the outside, what are you expecting the defense is doing by introducing these photographs? Why might they want them in? Probably because Jane doesn't look like she's 17 or 16 because she's in a soap opera and she probably looks very old. And so what they're trying to do is show the jurors, this is not somebody who looked under the age of 18, getting those documents admitted. So they skip over this now. They're done with Jane. They turn back over to Galen and Epstein. And remember that this has been a theme that we've been battling back and forth. Victim versus villain. Is Galen Maxwell a villain? Is she she's somebody who is the mastermind? Was she in cahoots with Jeffrey Epstein? Did she want to abuse everybody as badly as he did? Or was she sort of a subservient individual? Was she subordinate to him? Was there a hierarchy here? Was she a victim to Epstein? And is now the government manipulating this prosecution? They couldn't get Epstein, so they have to get Galen. But in reality, the defense says she's a victim here. So is it villain or victim? The defense is saying victim. Let's talk about this relationship. We know that the prosecution came out last week and we covered about, I don't know, 25 different photographs of Epstein and Maxwell. Just uh, uh, Joe Nearman from Good Logic yesterday said it best. They were canoodling all over the place. It was like a stinking Viagra commercial. They were frolicking in the hills, going through the dewy meadows sniffing flowers and stuff all over the place, all over the world while they were abusing, you know, allegedly a bunch of people. Looks like they're in cahoots. Looks like they're both villains. The defense is trying to rebut that. They're trying to say, no, this wasn't anything serious. They weren't really in cahoots. They weren't in a real relationship. He was dating a bunch of other people. He was sleeping around all over the place. What kind of woman would like to be with a man like that? Were they really boyfriend and girlfriend or something else? Everdell asks, says, 
Can you tell us about their relationship there, Kimberly? Kimberly says, well, I thought they were a couple, actually. You know, just their interaction together, they were a little flirty, stuff like that. And Everdell says, well, did their relationship change? Espinoza says, yeah. Maxwell started dating other men. Whoa. Is she two-timing on Epstein? Espinoza continues, says they would show up at the office around the same time and they would leave together. You know, things like that. Random guys, not Epstein, would show up. Galen Maxwell would get on the back of their Harleys and they would go out for ice cream. Classfield continues, says the attorney asks Espinoza about Maxwell's relationship with Ted Watt, the billionaire co-founder of Gateway. You know, she starts to have a little canoodle fest with him now. And so do you see what the defense is doing? These are not two peas in a pod. These are not yin and yang frolicking together down the hills. Maxwell's dating other people. Epstein, as we're going to see, is dating other people. And they've just moved. They're just not even together. Here's it, how it continues. She said that, yeah, they were at the time behaving like a couple, flirty, but it seemed like Galen moved on. I know she started dating. Boom, objection. U.S. attorney, objection. Nathan sustains that one. That was probably the gateway guy. Maxwell's lawyer, Everdell, says, and who came to visit Epstein at the office? Uh, he says, Gwendolyn Beck, Shelley Lewis. She was British. Other British women coming in. Maybe they're getting them confused with Galen. Very, very hard to say. Moving on, says Everdell. When Galen went to Florida, was it only Palm Beach? No, she went to Miami, too. She had a friend there, too. And then they stopped for the mid-morning break. They come back. Everdell continues. Do you know if Miss Maxwell got married, Kimberly? As soon as she starts to answer, you have a government prosecutor. Objection! Judge Nathan sustains it. Everdell says, okay, when did you have a video conference with the government about this case? Kimberly says, November 2020, they reached out to me. They lay some more foundation. We have another conversation. Everdell says, you were working there for a long time. Why did you leave? Kimberly says, after 9-11, I wanted to go back to California. I feel like Ghislaine was a good resource for my own career and what I learned and how to handle multiple projects at any one time. It really helped me get where I am today. That's why I left. And Everdell finishes. He says, did you ever see Epstein involved with young girls? Kimberly. Espinoza says, no. No further questions, mic drop. Adam Classfield says the same thing. Final direct examination questions. So Kimberly, did you ever see her engage in any type of inappropriate activity with underage girls? Kimberly says, never. And did you ever see Epstein engaged with any inappropriate activity with underage girls? Kimberly says, never. And nothing gave her the impression that anything of the sort was going on. So Kimberly then wraps it up. Sounds like Jeffrey and Galen are just a regular old couple. You know, they were kind of flirty from time to time, had a little bit of a breakup. Oh, well, she dates other people, a billionaire founder of Gateway Computers. He goes around and continues to frolic around in uh, global trafficking schemes. And Galen Maxwell didn't know anything about that. You know, poor Galen, she's just uh, kind of uh, caught up in this whole rub here. And so the defense is now making that argument. So the prosecutors come back out here and say very little. They say, all right, uh, Kimberly, you never went to Palm Beach, right? She says, no, no further questions. There you go. Never worked there. Whether she worked in any of his Epstein's homes, including his Palm Beach house. No. Did you ever work in the homes? No, I didn't work in the homes. She says, no. Okay. So what was all that testimony for? She was talking about a bunch of stuff, but did you work in the home? No. All right. So obviously you couldn't see anything. One question, you kind of wrecked the whole credibility of them or you don't, right? She worked hand to hand says never saw anything, never speculated anything. Everything was above board. Didn't even seem like they were a real couple for a long time. Kind of flirty, kind of together, but then not. And so that's Kimberly Espinoza. That was the first witness of the defense team. We have a quick second witness. Before we get into the real juicy witness of the day, 
expert witness, Dr. Loftus. We have a travel agent who comes up next, though, first. This is Raghu Sood. I believe it's Christian Everdell who's also examining him. This is very quick, one slide. He works for Shoppers Travel. He's basically a travel agent. He's going to come out and authenticate some invoices, some travel receipts. So Everdell says, all right, Raghu, where do you live? Well, I live in East Windsor, New Jersey. I work at Shoppers Travel, been there since 1988. I'm a vice president over there. Was Epstein a customer of yours? He says, yeah. And can you authenticate these travel records? And he says, yeah. And the prosecutor comes back out and says, these records, are they from 2006? And he says, yeah. And that's it. He's done. So we have some records that come in that are from a flight from a series of flights that were scheduled, obviously, through this travel company. It's all we know. Traveling back and forth. Okay, this is the defense people, right? They're trying to pin some dates down and some movements down. This is not the government trying to prove, you know, uh, trafficking. This isn't the government trying to prove that there was a flight that happened. This is the defense team coming in and submitting invoices that detail travel and who hired and paid for travel and who was flying around and all that stuff. Back from 2006, it looks like. Then we get to our next witness. Dr. Elizabeth Loftus is the big witness of Galen Maxwell trial day 11. She's a memory expert and a pretty world-renowned one, actually. has written a number of books on it and comes out and is going to try to convince the jurors that memories are contaminated, that these things get implanted in your brain, and what happened or what you think happened didn't actually happen in reality. Very, very interesting line of questioning. Let's take a look. Inner City Press reminds us that Elizabeth Loftus was somebody who testified for Harvey Weinstein. She comes out, first testimony that she gives us, and we're going to watch several videos from her, but she tells us, I've been consulted by everybody, DOJ, CIA. And she's published a number of different memory studies. I found a speech from this woman at a college university where she's describing how memory is so fluid and dynamic, how what we think happened actually typically doesn't happen, and we're contaminated by all sorts of different sources of information. Some of them are intended to contaminate your brain. We're going to learn more about her before we take a look at the testimony. Here she is speaking about memory to a group of people. Do you think I could make you remember if it did not happen to you, could I make you remember that when you were a kid, you saw a cat stuck in a tree and you went and rescued that cat? Could I make you remember that? Could I make you remember that when you were a kid, you were attacked by a vicious animal? If it never happened, could I give you a memory of that? Could I make you remember that as a teenager, you committed a crime and it was serious enough that the police actually came to investigate? Could I make you remember that just a week ago you played a card game and you, you cheated in the game and you took money out of, the, out of the bank, the game bank, that you weren't entitled to take? Could I make you remember these things if they didn't happen? Could I pour them into your memory bank? And, and I can tell you that lots of lay people say, I, I don't think so. I don't think you could ever make me remember I was attacked by an animal uh, if it didn't happen. But we'll see how you feel in another uh, 45 minutes or so. <laughs> so. And she does. She goes through a series of studies and she shows a number of different ways that people's memories are manipulated. And this is exactly why the defense called her in. They disclosed this to the U.S. government Back on November 1st, 2021, this is a little bit about her. She's a distinguished professor of psychological science and law, UC California, Irvine, nation's leading experts in the science of memory. In addition to her experience as an academic and clinical researcher, expert witness on hundreds of cases, she's a psychologist who's going to specialize in the study of memory. Based on her training and all of this, she's going to come in here and talk about the mechanisms of creation of false memories. Memories are actually created. She will describe the scientific research showing that false memories can be described with confidence, can be described with detail and emotion, just like true memories. This can occur when people come to believe in these experiences and are not deliberately lying. They believe it's true. 
she would identify some of the suggestive activities that occurred in the current case. And we're going to take a listen to her. She's going to explain this back to that group of students. What might some suggestive activities be? It might take a person from no memory of any abuse, even denying abuse, to later having, quote, memories for numerous abusive acts if the memories are false. She's going to explain the mechanism by which false and or distorted memories can happen post-information. With post-information, she's going to testify about the characteristics of false and distorted memories. Memories can be described with confidence even when they're false. There are suggestive activities that occurred in this case, things like the media coverage, publications, magazine articles, documentaries, you saw them on Netflix, news reports all over the place. She's going to explain how, in a case like this one, suggestion can lead individuals to construct distorted memories. And this woman is very well published. You can take a look at this, The Myth of Repressed Memory, which I bought, and I have a clip of it here. We're going to read through it. But she wrote, Witness for the Defense, and you're going to see that the prosecution kind of beats her up over this. What do you mean a witness for the defense? You're not a witness for the prosecutor. You seem pretty biased, aren't you? What about this book, Eyewitness Testimony? And she's got a whole stack of these books. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Do you remember, remember the guy in the Derek Chauvin case who was, I think he invented the lung. Remember that guy? I think it was Dr. Tobin. I think he like invented lungs, you know, 2.7 billion years ago. And so he knew everything about him. He wrote a book this thick about it and then testified, I think for a full day in the Derek Chauvin trial. This is kind of that version, but for the mind. Written everything. Some of this stuff is for public consumption, like the myth of the repressed memory. This is, this is an easy read, right? About, you can flip through other stories. But some of these are also you know, very, very detailed. Civil and criminal eyewitness testimony. You've got cognitive processes. Heavy, thick stuff that's used for technical cases. Here's the book that she wrote. The Myth of Repressed Memory, False Memories and Allegations. And here's what she says. According to many clinical psychologists, when the mind is forced to endure a horrifying experience, it has the ability to bury the entire memory so deeply in the unconscious that it can only be recalled in the form of a flashback triggered by a sight or a sound. You know what a flashback is. This book, though, reveals that despite decades of research, there is absolutely no controlled scientific support for the idea that memories of trauma are routinely banished into the unconscious and then reliably recovered years later. Since it is not actually a legitimate phys phys psychological phenomenon, the idea of, quote, a recovered memory in the moment and the movement that has developed alongside it is more closely related to a dangerous fad or a trendy witch hunt. So you can see what her perspective is on this. She talks about this in her book. She says, the problem for both the accuser and the accused is how to determine when a recovered memory is a reasonably accurate representation of past reality, whether it's a mixture of fact or fiction, or whether it's a complete fabrication. Is it actually real? Is it a mixture of real and fake, or is it all fake? Because we know that the mind doesn't remember things all that well. How does this work in practice? Here is Dr. Loftus explaining this to us, saying there is misinformation everywhere. Some of it's good information, some of it's misinformation, some of it's disinformation, that's information that is intentionally bad. Misinformation is information that is wrong. Disinformation is information that is knowingly wrong, but is put out there to try to make people believe it. You have billions of dollars every, every year that are spent trying to win your mind and provide you information and get you to think a certain way or buy a certain product or click a certain link or follow a certain person. There's stuff that is fed to you everywhere you turn on Netflix, your cell phone, people tell you, did you see that happen the other day? It's everywhere. And she's saying that people, even through the process of counseling and therapy and group session, if you're somebody who thinks maybe I was abused and you go sit in a group and a bunch of the people say, yeah, you were absolutely abused and you sit there for a year getting healing and treatment and trauma, is that reinforcing a memory? Maybe that memory that it's reinforcing is not actually reality. Maybe it's being manipulated. Here's how that works. This is Dr. Loftus. So the misinformation effect, you feed people misinformation it depresses their memory performance because they will often 
adopt that misinformation, and it causes an alteration, a transformation, a distortion in their prior memory. And, and why is this important? It's important because out there in the real world, misinformation is everywhere. We get misinformation when we talk to other witnesses or overhear other witnesses talk who jointly have had an experience. We get misinformation when we're interrogated by a biased interrogator who's got an agenda or a hypothesis about what happened and communicates that to the person Ooh. being interviewed. Mm -hmm. We get misinformation if we see a high publicity event, for example, and there are is television coverage or newspaper coverage in which other witnesses are interviewed and perhaps utter misinformation. All of these provide an opportunity for new misinformation to enter the consciousness of a witness and to cause this kind of distortion or contamination. Contamination of the mind and of the memory. So you can see that's pretty powerful. And I think a lot of people sort of instinctually understand this. You know, you kind of go, well, yeah, there's some truth to that. You know, because you remember back and you go, yeah, maybe, I, maybe I'm kind of thinking myself in a better light or a worse light. You just kind of misremember certain things. I mean, if you're honest with yourself, you know, what I do with my keys? Didn't I do that thing? It's not as perfect as we all like to think it is. And, and so if you listen to that full 45 minute presentation, she gives several examples where this happens. And so, you know, people are sort of persuaded to go a certain way by group think. And this is just something that we've all experienced naturally. People will fib and manipulate the truth because other people are going that direction, whether it's real or not. So we know that the prosecution really wanted to keep a lot of this out, right? They did not want Dr. Loftus to come in here and talk about any of this stuff because it's pretty powerful and it's also pretty damning, especially when on the direct exam from the prosecution, we talked a lot about it. Every one of these women, one of these victims, were, were a number of times in their testimony repeating over and over again, I don't recall. I can't recall. I don't remember. There were all sorts of problems with their recall ability. And so Dr. Loftus is going to be able to come in here and then slam dunk that to some degree. So when the prosecution is trying to keep this out, Bobby Sternheim, defense attorney, says, not happy about that, judge. She responded, this was yesterday, late at night, says, uh, dear Judge Nathan, the government's limitation on Dr. Loftus's testimony is a desperate attempt to restrict relevant testimony. Accusers, in this case, were asked, a, were asked suggestive questions during interviews and prep sessions with the government. See what they're saying? That these victims were asked suggestive questions during the interviews. They're calling Agent Young. They say, we anticipate Agent Young that he's gonna be testifying about the form of the questions asked during these interviews and these prep sessions. So they're gonna call their own government agent, Agent Young, and he's going to say, yeah, these are pretty problematic. A review of the disclosure material and Jane's testimony show exactly the type of questioning that the government posited during their investigation. When they were going and interviewing Jane, they're going, Jane, are you the victim of a crime? Tell us what happened. Uh, where did Epstein touch you? Well, I didn't say anything about Epstein. I know, but where did, uh, I'm sorry, where did Galen Maxwell touch you? Well, I didn't say anything about Galen either. Yeah, but Galen did touch you though. Well, maybe she did, right? And it's like these, obviously that's a bad example. It's overly suggestive, but you get the point of this. This is what Bobby is saying, that when they're being questioned, they're shoving thoughts and facts into their minds. She carries on. Let me give you an example, she says, Judge. By way of example, you remember that back during cross-examination, remember when Jane was on the stand, she was asked about the government's repeated questioning about that abuse in New Mexico. They asked her during two separate interviews, and during one of those interviews, three separate times. She's referring us over to the transcript. Jane has been asked about this abuse at New Mexico multiple times. Also, Bobby says, the government challenged Jane's recollection that she had seen The Lion King on Broadway during her first trip to New York at age 14, outright suggesting instead that she saw the movie. When Jane's counsel confirmed that she had seen the Broadway show, not the movie, a U.S. prosecutor, Ross Miller, told her lawyer that the government would just, quote, assume that the Lion King trip was not her first trip to New York, even though that is what Jane had reported to them. True to form, at the very next call with the government a few weeks later, she followed their lead and then suddenly, quote, remembered that the Lion King trip had not been her first trip to New York. 
isn't that convenient. Bobby is saying here, remember when Jane took the stand and she said that the first trip to New York was back when she went and saw The Lion King. It was a Broadway show on Broadway in New York. Defense says, well, that's neat because that happened three years later than when you said that you were there, which makes you three years older. So you're no longer a minor then. So when the prosecutor, Ross Miller, is now trying to figure this out, going, uh-oh, trying to pin down some timelines on this, she told her lawyer and everybody else that she saw the play, not the movie. Movie came out first, play came out afterwards. So if she actually saw the play and not the movie, she, it's three years after the fact. She's older. She's not a minor. It's not illegal. And so the prosecutor came back and said, well, we're going to have to just fib this whole thing. Maybe, let me, maybe let's say that your first trip to New York was actually not the play, you came further, even though it, you, you, you told us previously that your first trip was, in fact, a play. So this prosecutor is as, about as unethical as you can get because he was encouraging this person to change her story. She did. She conveniently remembered. Oh, yeah. Sorry. All that everything that I told you previously forgot about that. I must have gone to New York previously. So they're wanting to attack that memory. Her memory is obviously pretty fib. Kind of a big difference, isn't it? She says. With regard to response pressure, Professor Loftus may discuss the many different forms of suggestive processes that can have a witness memory, can have on a witness's memory. Dr. Rocchio, this was the grooming expert witness that the government proffered, she testified about parental factors that have no foundation in the record of this case. So your expert came out and talked about some irrelevant stuff. We let it go. She discussed violence between parents. And she discussed, quote, the extent that the parents themselves have experienced any form of abuse in their own backgrounds. So Bobby is saying that now the government's attempt to limit expert testimony contradicts the testimony that came out from their own witness. You're trying to stop our expert witness from talking about something. Your expert came out and already talked about it. Sternheim finishes, says Loftus's testimony on the effect of suggestive post-event information and the response pressure is relevant to within her area of expertise. Suggestion, she says, can come from a variety of sources. There is no reason at all to restrict expert testimony on the science of memory and the factors that impact memory. The government puts forth no be legal basis for stopping this. The government's extreme efforts to restrict Maxwell's rights should not be countenanced by the court. Very truly yours. Bobby Sternheim. And so that, of course, is tr the defense is trying to open up her line of testimony. They want her to be able to talk about basically whatever she wants. She's going to be a great witness for the defense because these cases are multiple decades old. And every single one of these victims has had a lot of memory problems from their own testimony. So the prosecution, by contrast, wants to keep this as narrowed as possible. They don't want this world renowned expert to come out here and start po poking holes in their case. Bobby Sternheim says, well, it's too bad. It's appropriate. And the court lets a lot of this in. So testimony starts again today, and I believe it's Christian Everdell who starts us off before we switch over to Bobby Sternheim. It starts. Loftus continues. Uh, Miss Everdell, uh, uh, Everdell says, Miss Loftus, rather, can you tell me uh, what's your experience testifying in court? Loftus says, well, I've testified 300 trials. I've only consulted with the prosecution, you know, maybe five times, and I've testified uh, only once for the prosecution. My research into false memory doesn't really fit into their agenda. Ooh! <laughs> you know, I'd be happy to, to uh, work with the prosecutors, but they don't like reality. They don't like science. Their basis, their, their understanding of memory, my interpretation of it doesn't suit their interests, so they never call me because... They don't like what I have to say. Loftus says, Your Honor, can I use this equipment here to show the jurors the three stages of the memory? We're going to get into this a little bit more. Pomerantz, U.S. prosecutor, no objection. Go ahead. You can use that equipment. Get up, do whatever you need to. Loftus says, the media is a source of post-event false memories and contamination. The media, we all know that. Media is garbage. She calls it, a source of contamination, which is absolutely true. She starts bragging a little bit and she says, and you know, when I was with the secret service and when I was consulting for them and she gets up and she draws this diagram, it's a barbell, like what you lift weights with. 
And on one end of the barbell, you have acquisition. On the other end of the barbell, you have retrieval. And in the middle of the barbell, the bar connecting both ends, you have retention. So it goes acquisition, retention, retrieval. Now she says some people might remember something as a dumbbell and labels it as such. Now Loftus has drawn a box under the bar of the barbell and has written the word in it time. Then they take a lunch break. Classfield gives us a little bit more here. Yeah, she's only been called to the prosecution about five or six times. She says she's been an expert for a long time, but the prosecutors don't appreciate it. She says specifically, quote, one thing we know about memory is that it doesn't work like a recording device. She starts diagramming this out. She calls the acquisition phase the first phase. Set phase two is the retention phase. She says after some time has passed, a person may be asked to remember the event or the events, she notes. Then we get to the retrieval stage. She says the media is a source of post-event suggestion because what you see after the fact might cause you to change your thoughts. This is a running theme of the defense case, and now Bobby Sternheim takes over questioning. She admits, I'm not a practicing therapist, but I do sometimes study patients. She says that when your brain is actually working, we're actually constructing our memories while we retrieve our memories. So in the act of going and getting your memory from your memory bank, you're actually creating it. So it's not like a, like a perfect recording device. It's changing as you're accessing it. Bobby says, all right, Ms. Loftus, Dr. Loftus, you know, outside of the laboratory, is there any way to prove that someone had an actual memory? Prosecutor objects to that and sustains it. Judge sustains it. Don't get to ask that question. Sternheim then moves on, says, can you tell me about your research? How about the confidence in memory? You know, when, you, when you're studying memory, are, are people confident in their memories? She says, well, people are a little more accurate when they're confident than when they're not confident. But she says people can only get, quote, very confident, or she says people can get, quote, very confident about wrong answers in cases of post-event suggestion, she testifies. It continues. Are you familiar with the concept that confidence is malleable? Right now she's talking about people having confidence in their beliefs. And remember that this idea of false memories is is that people don't necessarily know that they're false. They don't even think that they're lying. They think that these are real and accurate, and they can't tell the difference between a real and a fake memory. So now that people have these memories, what is their confidence level with these memories? Is it malleable? Does that change? She says, yes, people can express a level of confidence, and if they then get new information, it can artificially increase their confidence in what they are saying. So it can buttress it up. You can support it. It's like building a house. Sternheim asks Loftus about prestige-enhancing memory distortion. What happens after the fact? She says, we humans frequently remember ourselves in a better light than perhaps is accurate. Yeah, we sort of fib, right? You're like, yeah, I look good, man. I look really good today in this mirror. Look great. Well, maybe. Not so much. But maybe. It continues now. Cross-examination begins. Maureen Comey is out. I don't know who the actual person was doing the cross-examination, but we're done with Everdell. Government prosecutor comes out and says, all right, you've testified hundreds of times. Of those 100 times, you've consulted with the prosecution five or six times. That's it, right? Yep. About 150 criminal trials, only one of which was for the prosecution. And I wrote a book called Witness for the Defense prosecutor says, well, that's very interesting. You haven't written a book called uh, Impartial Witness, have you? Objection. She says, no, I don't have a book by that title. No, I didn't write that book. Pomerantz is now doing the cross-examination, says, let's talk about your consulting uh, and, and your book specifically. In the book, Witness for the Defense, you wrote that you should be an advocate. Loftus says, well, hold on a minute. That leaves out some context. Prosecutor cuts her off, obviously. This is a cross-examination. You don't want to give an expert witness like this a lot of room. So Pomerantz is going to keep cut cutting her off. Pomerantz says, you don't sit in a courtroom. I mean, you weren't present for testimony in this case, right? No, I was not present in this courtroom. And right now you're charging the defendant here, Dylan Maxwell. You're charging her, what, 600 bucks an hour for your time right now? Loftus says, yeah. 
And Pomerant says, and you were also paid for high profile defendants, right? Like millions of dollars. You represented Harvey Weinstein, didn't you? You were paid millions. Loftus says, I don't, I, mean, I don't know how much. Well, in 1975, you didn't charge $600 an hour, right? She says, no, I did it for free back then. But now you market yourself by testifying, right? She says, actually, no, I don't market myself at all. Pomerant says, but you give list of your cases to defense attorneys, right? She says, yeah, when asked. And you testified for Harvey Weinstein, didn't you? Judge Nathan says, whoa, 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 whoa there, Laura. Pomerantz. Pump the brakes there. They have a little bit of a break. They come back. Guess what? That Harvey Weinstein question doesn't come in. No more mention of the Harvey Weinstein stuff. Pomerantz says, and when you testify for high profile defendants, it brings you more business, doesn't it? She says, maybe it does. Prosecutor comes out and says, okay, Miss Loftus, you know, you were out here you showed fake photos of Bugs Bunny at Disney, right? Loftus says, yeah. She's talking about this study where people are asked whether they saw Bugs Bunny at Disneyland. And people say, yeah, yeah, he's there. Of course he is. It's Bugs Bunny. Mickey Mouse, Goofy, all of the Disney characters mini is donald duck one of them i'm not sure but you also have bugs bunny obviously who's a disney character right 16 percent of people say yeah yeah absolutely obviously clearly although that's not the case bugs bunny is warner brothers and so he's not going to be there at disneyland that's ridiculous bugs bunny is warner brothers says the prosecutor but 16 percent misremembered that we get an objection from the defense. They come up. There is a sidebar. They come back. Loftus says, all right. Yeah, some falsely remembered touching Bugs Bunny's head and him saying, what's up, Doc? And this, this, this is a science museum experiment, right? And there was another study that you talked about, something like a lost in the mall study. Something like 25% of people misremembered on that one, right? Prosecutor says, uh, I'm not going to ask you to describe a rectal enema, but it's a painful procedure, right? Loftus says, yeah. And the prosecutor says, and this memory about these uh, rectal enema, that could not be easily implanted. <laughs> so I'm not real sure what they were getting into there. Prosecutor was asked if she ever conducted a study to try to implant false memories of abuse. Loftus replies, no. Prosecutor gets Loftus to concede that those who experience trauma may forget peripheral details, but, quote, core memories tend to be stronger. So you see the difference here? Prosecution is saying, okay, yeah, 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 people have problems with memories, but those are peripheral memories. Those are like, what was the color of the couch, right? Not uh, him forcefully inserting his thing into something. I not, I'm not forgetting that part of that. Okay, I remember that. Yeah, the color of the couch the date, the time, the year, the location. Yeah, look, you know, exactly the specifics. I don't remember. It was 20 years ago. But I can remember other things that were a little bit more uh, penetrating into my brain. And the prosecution gets that out of Dr. Loftus. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the core stuff, the core memories, they do tend to be stronger. But the peripheral stuff certainly goes away. We get a brief redirect. Inner City Press reports on this. Maxwell's lawyer comes back out and says, okay, look, Inner City Press, uh, I'm sorry, Bobby Sternheim, remember where we finished off with the government? They said, uh, you've never done any studies on childhood trauma of this type, right? You've never done anything like that? And so you can't really speak to any of this stuff because you've never done a study about that. So obviously you don't know. You've done all these studies about people remembering stop signs versus yield signs, but not this one. Why not? And Maxwell's lawyer comes back out and says, uh, aren't there restrictions on the kinds of studies that you can do? Like you can't actually go and, and test those types of things on abuse victims, can you? Prosecutor objects, but the judge, judge allows it. Loftus says, yeah, we can't implant memories of abuse. Unethical. 
So yeah, that's why we don't have studies about that. So that was Dr. Elizabeth Loftus. That's our memory expert. Now, she wasn't a doctor who was a specific, you know, analyst in this case. She didn't interview any of these victims or give a, you know, a summation of their memory. But she's doing the same thing that Dr. Lisa Rocchio did when she came out and talked about the U.S. government. For the U.S. government. She talked about the five stages of rooming. Here, Loftus is giving us a different framework, an opposing framework. Rather than saying that Galen and Epstein followed steps one, two, and three to groom these women, something else happened. They're misremembering. They've got prestige memory bias. They're remembering themselves in, the, in an old light. They are creating ideas that are being buttressed by the media. It's being contaminated, and it's not reliable. These are very old cases, and you can see it through the different framework that she laid out. Tomorrow, and with other witnesses, we'll see if they fill in those gaps, if they use her framework to say, oh, this is exactly why victims one through four are all missing key bits of their memory. They're being manipulated, and a lot of this is being funneled and fueled by money. The three themes that Bobby Sternheim delineated for us at the start of the case. The next witness that the defense for Galen Maxwell called is a Border Patrol agent. Very interesting witness to call. His name is Michael An Aznaran. He's a Border Patrol agent. We can see Maxwell's lawyer we have cross-examining him, or I'm sorry, direct examining him, is Christian Everdell, I think. I'm not sure who exactly did it. Very short witness. We call Michael William Asneran, Your Honor. Christian Everdell asks for a sidebar right away. Judge says, will you wait for the break? He says, fine. Everdell says, all right, Mr. Anzaran, where do you work? He says, I work for the Customs and Border Protection. We check incoming people. Now, we have to pause on this one for a moment. The defense is calling, sounds like, an active Customs and Border Patrol person to come in and testify. This is interesting on a couple different levels. Number one, this is an official government employee, right? This is somebody who is sort of operating under the veil of authority. When a defendant is being prosecuted, one of the very difficult things to overcome is the fact that the government is the government. It's just that simple fact. It's sort of the, 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 the moral authority, the legal authority that everybody has delegated a lot of their decision-making to. So if you have a situation where you've got a, a defendant who's being prosecuted by a bunch of people in uniforms, officer, FBI agent, I'm special agent, here's my badge. I'm an officer, I've got my full uniform on. I've got a badge, I've got a gun, I'm official, I'm authoritative, and they just bring in one after the other, one after the other. It really makes it look bad for the defendant. Because you have all these government officials that everybody trusts and, and respects and thinks are heroes. And they're out here just badgering this defendant who's just this poor person who has nobody on his side to come out and speak up for him. Here, though, the defense is bringing out a government employee. This is a Customs and Border Patrol person. Uh, my question is, is he showing up in uniform? Is he going to show up in civilian clothes? Or is he going to show up in his official uniform in Customs and Border Patrol sitting there on the stand just like a police officer would testify in any criminal trial? If it does... Do you see how this sort of flips the narrative? It's like the government, it's like, it's almost taking the government's authority away from them. Oh, you have your government special agents and border patrol people, and you've got all your officials who did their investigation. Well, we're going to call our own government officials and we're going to bring them out and they're going to sit there in their uniforms and they're going to testify about what they did. And we're going to use that to show that your investigation isn't so hot because your own government is presenting conflicting information. We have official government employees who are coming out and providing evidence that we're using. We're not hiding from anything. We'll bring the government right out here and put them on the stand, in fact. They did that. So this continues on. Maxwell's lawyer says, all right there, Mr. Asneran, can you take a look at this exhibit? It's government, ex or it's a GX-12. We're gonna call her Jane. Did you do a search for this one? He says, yeah, I did. And uh, how about Kate and Annie Farmer? Did you search for them too? He says, yeah, I did. I did the searches. So judge, uh, now we need the sidebar. Says, all right, well, get the jurors their afternoon break. Jury leaves. Judge doesn't mention snacks or Hot Pockets. Nathan says, uh, 
Mr. Azaran, can you step out, please? <clears throat> Prosecutor comes up and says, listen, Judge, there are 15 years of records here, including outside, all sorts of stuff that's outside the charges time frame, and we don't want to see any of this stuff come in. They're going through a bunch of records there. Prosecutor says, we don't want any of this stuff coming in. But he comes back. Now they bring Azaran back onto the stand. He's inspecting this exhibit. He's looking at this massive document. He's been reciting border entry records for three of Maxwell's accusers. So talking about, I don't know, Kate and Annie and Carolyn and Jane. And when they're coming across the border, when is it? Uh, okay, Jane's here on, you know, September, whatever, whatever, whatever. All of these records appear to have date of birth information, birth date information. Interesting. Klasfeld says, he's watching this, he says it's unclear to what end the defense wanted this information in. They don't really know why that they wanted this information in, but it seems like they're trying to establish ages at particular times. In other words, when people are coming across the border and it's being entered by Border Patrol into the records, they bring Michael Asneran to come out here, read, authenticate the records. Yeah, this is an official document. This is what it says. This is the time and date. And this is the birth date. And remember, we're talking about minors. Classfield notes that often the purpose of the evidence is going to become more revelatory when we get to closing arguments. So now we're on cross-examination. All this witness did is talk about some basic stuff, about some basic records. Prosecutor comes back out, asks the witness the difference between Border Patrol records before and after 9-11. Oh, they changed. As Naran says, well, you know, prior to 9-11, there was a little bit of a difference between how the records were submitted back then and the reliability of the airlines was, you know, it wasn't as good as it is now. So records are a little bit better now. Now, this is about all we get out of this witness. It's just a transactional guy. We've seen a lot of these from the prosecution. We, taught, we had bank records. We had uh, school records. We had a lot, a lot of records, a lot of transactional witnesses. They're all in the mind map, which is linked down in the description below. The mind map as of today is not updated with today's witnesses, but I will do that tonight. We have more testimony here. Now, trial wraps up today with this witness. His name is Dominic, or I think it might be her name, Dominique Hippo Light. Now, it's at 4.52 in the afternoon. We're almost done with trial. Judge Nathan, man, she runs a tight ship. It's 4.52. Everybody's like, oh, my can we just get out of here? She says, no, defense, you can call your next witness. They do. It's Dominique Hippolyte. Maxwell's lawyer, Everdell, says, all right, Dominique, where do you live and work? Well, she says, I work in the Palm Beach School District. I coordinate the processing of subpoenas, and I represent the district as the records custodian. So we get another transactional person. She comes in at 4.52 p.m. Looks like we get like one question out of her. Maxwell's lawyer walks up. Uh, may I approach the witness with a document, judge? Judge says, nope, 5 p.m. We're done. Done for the day. Prosecutor says, we could just stipulate to this. You know, like, what, what are we trying to get in here? Records of what? Palm Beach schools? We could just stipulate to this. We're just going to agree to this, judge. We don't even need to show this document or authenticate it. We'll just stipulate to this. Meaning we'll just agree to it. Defense then identifies the remaining witnesses. We've got Eva, we've got Michelle, and we've got Kelly. Judge says, who else is left? She identifies three people. Depending, of course, on your rulings, Judge. Now, remember, yesterday we talked about another motion that was submitted. The defense wants to interview three different, or they want to call as witnesses, three different lawyers who represented a number of the different victims of this case, saying that, as we talked about earlier with Jane, that a prosecutor was essentially trying to manipulate the investigation or the facts of this case by convincing Jane that she had already been to New York previously or that she didn't in fact see the Broadway play she saw the movie, which is different than what she reported originally. So if the defense is able to interview her lawyer about that conversation with the prosecutor, the judge allows that in, we may see some additional witnesses. If the judge does not allow that in, then it sounds like we may be done with this very soon. Nathan says letters are due by tonight at 7.30 p.m., We'll see if those ultimately get docketed. Laura Menninger tells the judge, we might even end tomorrow or on Monday. Could be done soon. Nathan says, oh, it's fine. No problem then. We're going to have closing arguments on Monday. Then we're going to charge and then it's going to be off to the jury. So before Christmas, it sounds like. 
Nathan says, well, usually at this point in time, it's when I allocute the defendant. That's when I ask if they'll testify and then read them, you know, all the warnings there. But defense says, well, hold off, judge. Let's do that tomorrow. We're going to make a final decision on this thing. And we'll come back and we'll make, we'll do the allocution tomorrow. Judge Nathan says, all right, well, we'll do the closings and we'll do the charge on Monday. Meaning deliberation starts on Tuesday, December 21st. Nathan excuses them. We're done. They're going to draft the charge tomorrow. The defense agrees to closings on Monday. Seems Maxwell, it seems clear that Maxwell will not testify. So the judge will then be demanding the letters by 7.30 p.m. tonight. Trial ended for the day. Laura Manager says, I think we will be done, Your Honor. Maybe a short witness on Monday, but that might be it for the trial. And so that was day 11 of the Galen Maxwell trial. Saw a lot of activity today, but may not see much more. Sounds like Laura Manager and the Maxwell defense team are saying tomorrow might be the last day with maybe a very short witness on Monday. And so let's see what you have to say about this over from our friends at watchingthewatchers.locals dot com and see what we've got here from oh uh, from our community over there and by the way i saw vienti kiss i think sent our first rumble rant of all time vienti kiss prime over on rumble says let's test my memory is this your first rumble rant i think it is vienti kiss i'm pretty sure it is i think you're right about that and i also see some other people chatting away over there we have Colopie. we've got uh who else is there elucidation station vienti kiss prime is there as well shout out to everybody on rumble growing over there as well and so let's take a look at our questions from watching the watchers dot locals dot com first one in the house was from yesterday oh that's right because uh yesterday we couldn't take any questions that's that's right because we were on viva's show all right so maybe we'll get to some of these today let's see here uh we've got kevin in az says hey rob what did we expect from the prosecution the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. That's from Kevin and AZ uh, talking about Comey, Maureen Comey, daughter of James Comey. James Comey, obviously kind of a disaster for the FBI. Did you see that news story from the FBI? Apparently they were sleeping with prostitutes all around the world. I feel like that happens every like 10 years or so. Maybe it's like every 20 years is an FBI story of them sleeping with a, a bunch of prostitutes in some third world country. <laughs> Ridiculous. Okay, we have Kincaid says, hey Rob, Good evening and great discussions at Viva's. I have camera questions. I'm guessing a pretty low f-stop, so what kind of lens and brand have you decided to use? Your video seems real clear, perhaps Sony below the 3200 ISO. It's a good question there, and you know your, you know your, your stuff. So uh, let's see what I've got here. I've got ISO 1000 that I'm looking at. Uh, f1.8, it's a Sigma lens, 16 millimeter, I believe. The camera is a Sony a6400, but I'm upgrading. I've decided to spoil myself. I'm going to be getting the Sony a7 IV. Oh my gosh, don't even look that camera up. I'm going to get it. I never, you know, I never splurge on anything. And since YouTube is kind of a thing for me now, we're going to get a nice, a nicer new camera. But it's a lot more expensive. The Sony a6400 is really all you need. I mean, honestly, it's overkill even for probably streaming. I mean, I think it looks great, but the, the stream, you know, compresses the quality so much. So live streaming, you know, it's going to condense it down to 1080p and it's going to be, you know, not real great. But if you're going to be recording, this camera's perfect. You get beautiful, crisp 1080p. You also get a good bokeh effect with the, it's a Sigma lens, Sigma, uh, I think it's Sigma 16 millimeter. I have a whole list of all my gear, a whole list in a spreadsheet on monday.com if you want it. So uh, I can post that in locals. I think other people have asked for that, but it's a good question, Kincaid. Good stuff. Let's see. We've got another one. T. Blakemore says, have you ever experienced a prosecutor just phoning it in because they weren't invested in the trial? Yeah, of course. Of course. Yes, of course. Happens all the time. Typically, it happens when you have a cop who's being charged with a crime. We had that here in the state of Arizona. I think that that was a travesty of justice that that involved uh, Matthew Brailsford. Uh, yeah, Brailsford. I just can't imagine having the amount of abuse that's happened with Epstein and only a few people testify while the defense has 35. Also, wasn't it just way too convenient that the judge testified before the Senate at a time when she could not comment on the case she is currently presiding over? Seems like she's in the middle of the biggest and most notable case of her career, and nobody can question her on it for this promotion. So many conveniences. Yeah, very, very, very convenient, isn't it, T. Blakemore? I'm with you. I agree. We have a couple more. We've got Kincaid says... 
Since you explained the battles of realities in the courts against the socially constructed reality agreed upon, I was reminded of research that rips images directly from the brain. The link below, no more experts fighting over in whose interpretation wins. NNN, scientists extract images directly from the brain. I think I might have seen stuff like this. Yeah, I think I might have seen this. Let's see if we can pull this up. Let's see what this looks like. Okay, so this is a technology company. Yeah, so I think I've seen some images where there was... AI software that would sort of scan the brain and then try to guess what you were thinking. I think I saw like, and it, it, it kind of was weirdly like right. Like somebody was thinking of the Mona Lisa and this brain scan like assembles the Mona Lisa. You're like, what? This is weird. So uh, stuff like that is probably coming. So get ready for it. Elon is trying to implant it into your brains. Kincaid says, when it comes to court instructions regarding only a yes or no, if a lawyer can argue for expanded response, can a witness do the same? So, uh, typically not, right? I mean, if 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 a if a if a defense attorney is conducting the cross examination and you are you know asking for yes or no's, you can you know push back on a witness and ask questions that are only yes or no's. Now, if you know if it becomes too combative and you're not allowing the witness to answer, the judge may say, well, let him answer, right? It's not, it's not that simple. Your question is inartful or it's not clear. And so you're going to give them the opportunity. You know, it's about communicating, but you're not, but you also want to make sure that people aren't getting squirrely on you and just starting, you know, if you give an expert witness an open question, an open forum, they'll just talk forever and they'll steal the whole, the whole show. And they're typically pretty good at it. Vianticus Prime says, victim and villain. Let's split the difference and call her Villictim, just because it'd be fun to say. It's true. It is kind of fun to say. Villictim. Sounds kind of gross, though. <laughs> Sergeant Bob says, uh, dangerous territory. If one extrapolates this, no witness is credible in any case. Well, that's true. Yeah, Sergeant Bob. That's true. That's a defense attorney's dream come true. Yeah, they're all, they're all full of it. Yeah. <laughs> publishing books does not establish expertise yeah but she's got 20 of them there sergeant psychology is so subjective not really scientific experts will take either side having said that eyewitness identification can be a bit problematic but that is another story and that's from sergeant bob <laughs> who yeah i understand your, your your point there sergeant bob and of course we're on opposite ends of the spectrum on this one but i do like the concept of exploring the idea, right? People, I think, I think people sort of instinctually recognize that memory is not that great. And when you start to sort of flush it out on these uh, studies and you start to see really how malleable it is, people, I think, you know, their eyebrows raise up a little bit. Speech Unleashed says, regarding false memories, there's something called the Mandela effect, where tons of people recall the name item falsely, the named item falsely. For instance, Darth Vader never said, Luke, I am your father. He actually said, no, I am your father, which is true. Another one is that the most people remember C-3PO as being all gold, but he actually had a silver leg. Which I didn't know that one. <laughs> what? The site has 48 more false memories that a lot of people have. Entity mag, Mandela effect. Yeah, look, memory is, is not... It is not like a recording device. There's no question about that one. That's a great, thank you for that speech. We have John Halgren says, memories, traumatizing events, and the way we handle them can never be looked at as a science where there's a right or a wrong way to analyze each individual. We've learned that just because someone doesn't react the way we think they should is proof that we shouldn't make assumptions in this area. Example, why isn't she crying or upset? This news is so terrible. People have been convicted because of their initial reactions to trauma and then later released when other evidence found exonerating them. Bottom line for me, use facts and steer away from emotions. Yeah, it's a good question, John. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's an it's a eternal battle. Because both are pretty powerful. You know, emotions are very powerful. You know, we've talked a lot about Joe Nierman. Good logic. He's down there. I didn't get a clip from him today. To I, I didn't ask him for one. But I was going to clip something from his postings today. And I spaced that. Sorry, Joe. But Joe is doing great work over there. We had a long talk with him yesterday on Viva's channel. And he is a, a master storyteller. He tells about the emotion. He was talking specifically about, I think it was, it was either Caroline or one of the victims. And on his channel, he talked about how Maureen Comey actually came out 
and was just almost abusing her, treating her as almost a hostile witness. And it was extremely emotional. And this woman is breaking down on the stand and crying and screaming, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, but I know that I was abused, I know that. Crying and sobbing, and it was very emotional. And the way Joe tells the story, you're like sitting there thinking, how could I be a juror and, not, and watch that and go the opposite direction? But that's all emotion, John, is exactly what you said, right? It's all emotion. If you think about it logically, she doesn't remember anything. I don't remember, 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 I don't remember. Okay, but she's very emotional. She's very sad about it. And if you listen to Joe tell the story, it sounded like it was very powerful and very effective emotionally, but factually, it was garbage. Doesn't remember anything. If you read a transcript of this, you'd say, this witness is terrible. She doesn't know what the hell she's talking about. Who called her to the stand? But because of the emotions, right? And, and this is why a lot of people, you know, in law, they'll say, well, the law says this, that, and the other. And you go, so what? It's great. It's neat. What does the jury say? What does the judge say? What does the prosecutor say? That's where practice comes into play. And that's why it's fun to be a defense attorney because we get to make those arguments. If you have bad facts, then you pound the law. If you have bad law, then you pound the facts. If you have, you know, neither of those, you pound the table. That's the emotion. You just, ah! And it can work. As you can see, it's very persuasive. People buy it. All right, we have Monster One says, so Miss Loftus, you were in the Secret Service. Would this have happened to have been in the mid-90s, you know, when a certain Slick Willie was in the office? Oh my gosh, it's a good question. We have another one. Vientica says, the problem with this expert's testimony on false memories is that in her little experiment, there's other factors that come into play. Some people will say yes because of the same techniques that an attorney uses to develop a cadence with a witness. If you get someone to be agreeable, they'll just try to agree. Sometimes people will try to agree just to fit in. So while I would agree that this would lead to the creation of false memories, I argue that those memories would be as ephemeral as the relevancy as to, to this conversation. Another thing that comes into play is the phrasing of the idea to take the question, quote, if I had 13 cookies and I ate all but eight of them, how many do I have left? The, F, the answer is the question eight. I ate all but eight of them. How many do you have left? Eight. The phrasing of the question in specific ways elicits specific responses, especially if someone is not being attentive. There are many ways to manipulate an unsuspecting people on the spot to do little things. Just some thoughts that I have. Well, thank you, Vienti, because that's a good one. Yeah. And, you know, you see this all the time in... Um, in these riddles and these puzzles and things, sometimes your mind just looks right over stuff or sometimes it focuses on certain things. And a lot of this is by design. I mean, a lot of this, you know, they know how the mind works. You, the marketing companies and politicians, they spend billions of dollars to try to get you to do certain things and believe certain things and vote a certain way and buy a certain product and show up at a certain time. And there are entire industries geared towards that. And they've got computer algorithms that are trying to make you kill each other over in the comment section. So, yeah, memory's fluid. Kincaid says, oh, wow, man, nice. Being, uh, being legally, I love to take night shots. Your new camera has the ability to see the Milky Way in the camera. Well, that's amazing. I didn't know that. What I like about it is it's, uh, it's got just a really high sensor. And so it should be able to shoot 4K video like boom. And this camera, you know, kind of struggles with that. This camera's a this camera's a great camera, but it's it's a few years old, right? It's an older model. And so that new camera, it's gonna be brand new, it's gonna be great. King Cade says, we care talking about soft sciences, models, and the scientific methods should reign supreme via the crowdsourced open discussion, which is not true in courts or the media. Yeah. Yeah, more, more openness in courts, more transparency and accountability would all be very good. I would be very supportive of that. And looks like that, my friends, is it for us for the day. No other questions and no other super chats. And so we're going to leave it there. I want to thank everybody for joining us and for being a part of the show. Tomorrow, Friday, but we've got Galen Maxwell trial day 12. And that means we might be done with it. We might be done with the whole trial means we might come back on Monday, have the charging, which is the handing off of the case over to the jurors. And they may be deliberating on this thing. Could we get a ruling before Christmas? Because if it goes to the jurors on Monday or Tuesday, then we've got the 23rd, 22nd, maybe. Is the judge going to make them deliberate on Christmas Eve? I don't know, but it's going to be fun, and we're going to continue to follow it along. One final reminder to subscribe and leave us a like before you get out of here. If you left, left us a comment, also, I'd appreciate that. 
mind map is available down in the description if you want to share that or poke around. I am going to update that today, tomorrow, as the rest of this trial finishes up. And so we're grateful to have you here and a part of the program. We are going to be back here to do it again tomorrow. Let me give some shout outs to some new supporters we've got over at watching the watchers dot locals dot com. We've got welcoming big welcomes to not RWC 110. Welcome. We've got Chuck Davids here. We've got Mark on W. We've got Shin Dog. We've got Nosy Texas Rosie. And I've got the best Nosy Rosie story from my college days. I'll have to tell it at some point. Welcome, Nosy. We've got Taz Mom is here. Cookie Monster 2. We've got AJ Darsha. Molly Pop Inc. Guitar Terry. We've got Randy J98 Westworld's here. Equestrian Girl. Richie DC. Red Jersey. Nikki Dragon. Things and Stuff. We've got Donna 107. The Vez. Jimmy W's in the house. Big Brother Bites. Kimmy Cat 03, Kevin AZ, Antar 24, the Queen of Tennessee is here, along with Rebby Lee, Music Box Lady, we've got Big Ree in the house, Phantasma Gloria, Black Cat Meow, Nick McLeod, Dr. Brenton T. Blakemore, and Patriot Minute, all a part of our amazing community over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And I hope to see you over there, my friends. Otherwise, I'll see you back here tomorrow. Same time, same place. Galen Maxwell trial, day 12, 4 p.m. Arizona time, 5 p.m. Central in Texas, 7, 6 p.m. on the East Coast. And for that one Florida man, my friends, I hope to see you here because I need your help so that together we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding Justice. I'll see you tomorrow, my friends. Have a great night. Bye-bye.